I think we can start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia Zabriski. I'm director of the Center for um, the Center for European Studies. Before I introduce our speaker today, I want to flag uh, two upcoming events. Uh, one is the Copernicus Center for Polish Studies exhibition, Survivors Saving for Survivors, Photographing the Ukrainian Refugee Experience in Poland by uh, Chuck Fishman. It's actually in the gallery space next door. Uh, we're waiting for the main signage, but uh, it's actually ready to, to be viewed um, from today until the end of April. And then accompanying the exhibition, we will have uh, the Copernicus, the annual Copernicus lecture with the director of the JCC, the Jewish Community Center in Krakow, Jonathan Ornstein, um, who welcomed uh, thousands and feeds every day uh, several hundreds Ukrainian family at the GCC in Krakow. So he will be coming talking about the center's initiative and the Jewish community's reception and help for the Jew uh, not for the Jewish community, for the Ukrainian refugees at large, regardless of ethnicity and religion, together with Chuck Fishman, the photographer. And that event is taking place on March 22nd at 5 p.m. at the Stern Auditorium of uh, the Museum of Art. And now, uh, today is a Conversations on Europe, um, and I have the pleasure to introduce Lubert Khan, who's um, a visiting professor uh, this year at uh, the, the, the Center for European Studies and the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. Uh, professor Khan is a professor of economics at, at I apologize, and please forgive my pronunciation, the Hankook University of Foreign Studies in Seoul, Korea, where he previously was previously Dean of the Language and Trade Division uh, and also editor of uh, the, the Hankook University Press. He teaches undergraduate courses in international economics and trade and graduate courses in development uh, economics and in EU studies, and he obtained his uh, PhD at a um, prestigious, prestigious, prestigious Sciences Po in Paris. And uh, he speaks beautiful French, beautiful English. Um, his main research interests are trade policy, economic integration, and comparative studies of economic policies. And he's also deeply interested in European cities from an economic perspective. Uh, previously, he worked at uh, the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, where he published 40 policy reports about issues related to European econo economics, and as an external consultant for the Korean Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Industry and Trade. Uh, he participated in that respect in the implementation and assessment of Korea's trade agreements. Professor Kang has contributed more than 70 academic articles to journals, including the Journal of uh, European Integration, the Journal of Contemporary European Studies, uh, the Journal of Economic Integration, and Asian Development Review. And he has co-authored or contributed to uh, approximately 30 books about international uh, economics and European studies. Um, he's been with us since September, uh, he's got a little office space, workspace here at the center, uh, a wonderful colleague, and so it gives me great pleasure today to have him present his work. So please join me in offering him a very warm welcome. Hey, uh, hello everybody. Um, this is very, this is my honor to present uh, some of the work here. And uh, uh, as Junepia to introduce about me, uh, I arrived here in late eight, uh, late August uh, last year with my family. And we are really satisfied with our daily life in Ann Arbor, and we are appreciate the welcoming of uh, Wise Center and our colleague. And also, I really appreciate our Ukrainian colleague who are here. And my deep uh, solidarity go to Ukraine, and I uh, provide the full support for Ukraine for coming years. Uh, well, uh, probably you are, some of you are curious why what the, the Korean and the Asian scholar is just here in 
respect for European studies. Uh, the main reason is uh, actually my main work area is uh, actually Europe. I was trained as a trade economist when I do a PhD, but since I work in Korea, I'm just to naturally, I, I, actually I was, uh, I studied in, in France. So many people pushed me to work on European economy. So European study became a kind of my specialty without my, I mean, regardless of my the intention, but uh, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, the, that this study and it's very dynamic. And uh, as probably, you know, as we all agree, Europe is the region that humanity uh, invented all kind of social mechanism for last 1,000 years, 2,000 years. So we can find many, many examples whenever we are uh, doing a case study, even for Korea, we can find kind of a benchmark in, in Europe. Uh, well, uh, my presentation today uh, is about the economic uh, relationship between uh, Europe and Russia. Uh, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the actually, particularly the energy issues, and uh, the, I will try to introduce how European view a war in Ukraine and uh, what will be uh, kind of a future perspective on uh, these issues. Well, uh, let me go. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I organized the table content in that way. I will try to. Uh, just to describe a little bit of the invasion of Ukraine and response of the European countries. And also I will touch a little bit on Europe, Russia energy relation, which go back to 1960s, even during a Cold War period. And also the, I will uh, try to explain uh, what is the EU response, particularly on energy issues uh, when uh, in the context of war in Ukraine. And then uh, the, I will introduce uh, some uh, statistic and figure which is a change in EU Russia economic relation. Because I'm an economist, I mainly use a kind of economic indicator and statistic to provide a kind of a general picture on what's going on in Europe. And also in final section, I will try to explain how European perceive that crisis. And I'll just raise a kind of a tentative question. Uh, can Europe maintain unified and coherent stance vis-a-vis Russia? So uh, let me start quickly. Okay, uh, as we know, uh, EU has been imposing sanctions on Russia since 2014 when the, uh, Russia annexed the, the Crimea by force. And uh, this sanction uh, is was composed of a kind of asset freeze and entry ban of key person and restriction of financial asset and some export plan of item of high technology. But the I let me just qualify this sanction as a soft sanction and much weaker than US sanction because actually it's a meeting just to, uh, not just but it's, it's complicated, but uh, the main motivation of this sanction is to meet diplomatic need and minimizing uh, economic damage. EU never, never during that period, the European Union never raised Russian energy sector as a sanction target and uh, neither Russia. Uh, if you look at the, that figure, uh, actually this is cotton and United States uh, proposed to Europe, uh, let's just ban Russia all imports, but the European, they hesitate because the main reason is uh, Europe is very dependent on Russian energy. Russian energy. I will show some figure later, but the roughly 25% of total energy need of Europe came from Russia. So. There is a kind of uh, the, the, the relation between the uh, two sides. And Germany uh, continued to its Nord Stream 2 project and the EU sanction and opposition from the US. And also some country, particularly uh, Central and Eastern European country proposed to create a kind of a platform to purchase Russian gas in common way, all together with the European, in the name of European Union. But the Western European country was very hesitant and that uh, project was never realized. So uh, just before the Russian invasion in Ukraine, EU Russian economic relation was just as usual, as usual, and uh, under mutual soft sanction imposed to each other. Uh, if you get the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, this, it's okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, if you get the position of uh, each country regarding sanction on Russia before the war in Ukraine in this uh, last two years, we can classify all countries into five categories. The first group of countries is the Russian hawk, the country who demand a stronger sanction against Russia. Uh, those countries are Germany, UK, uh, Nordic countries such as Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, and also the Baltic states and Poland. Uh, for UK and Denmark, they have a, I mean, they have a similar the policy stance vis-a-vis -vis Russia together with the United States. And Germany have a kind of principle separate economic and politics. Uh, Germany, as a leader of the European Union, insists that uh, the EU should impose sanction, but the Germany want to maintain a kind of economic relation with Russia, particularly on uh, the, the, the gas project. And then Sweden, Finland, and Baltic states, they have a security concern over Russia. It's why they have uh, the strong they demand strong action. For France, Spain, and Portugal, they have a uh, they just want to maintain status quo. So they just, uh, they were kind of a lukewarm supporter uh, because uh, France insists that uh, the Europe have to maintain proper relation with Russia. And uh, Spain and Portugal, when we go back to 2014, actually the Spain and Portugal was uh, on the verge of recovery from economic recession. Mm -hmm. uh, economic relation with Russia, particularly tourism and uh, the, the real estate sector was very important. So that, this kind of background provide a kind of rationale to have a, a kind of a, the, the lukewarm attitude vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And for Central and Eastern European countries, such as Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Bulgaria, they have a rather ambiguous position because their public opinion divide into two parties. Some people, we have to, we need a stronger action, but some people say, oh, we have to take care of our economic relation with Russia. So their political and business elite divided two parties. So it was very hard for them to create one unified voice at national level. For Russia's friend, those countries, it was a little bit of contentious, I mean, the contentious uh, the argument, but the, the country like Italy, Hungary, Greece, the Cyprus, Australia, they have a good relation with Russia uh, due to different reasons. Some of them have a due to dependence of Russia, uh, dependence of their energy on Russia. And some of them have a political history or cultural relation with Russia. So it's a main reason. And some country bystanders such as Ireland and Malta, uh, they don't have any negative experience with, uh, with Russia because they are far from Russia. So, so they are just absorbing. That was uh, the typical attitude of European country before, before war in Ukraine. Okay. But everything has changed since February 2022. Since the war in Ukraine, all EU member states uh, have come to hardline countermeasure against Russia, and European Union implement the most comprehensive and restrictive measure over Russia under its common security and defense policy. That sanction is really wide and it covers finance, energy, transportation, defense, media, raw material, and almost everything. And what is particular is actually it directly target Russian energy and banking sectors. And this is the most powerful coercive diplomacy that you can take over Russia. So that sanction is completely different from the old sanction of the European Union after the annexation of Crimea. And uh, uh, for for the first time, the European Union allowed to finance military weapons for third countries, and also Germany stopped the Nord Stream 2 project, and most of the EU member countries provide the military aid to Ukraine. As we know, EU is composed of 27 countries, and when I just count in, uh, there are only three countries who didn't uh, provide weapons to Ukraine, but you can figure out, I don't care. So the 24 countries, together with the UK, they provide all kind of support to Ukraine. Okay. Uh, next three slides explain the EU sanction. EU imposed 10 packages of sanction from uh, 23 February last year. It's just one day before invasion. And then the uh, last sanction was uh, just last month. And then 
Uh, and I don't go into detail, but what I want to emphasize is uh, the, the blue one, the sanction on energy sectors. European Union decided to impose a ban on import on uh, Russian coal to the European Union and oil as well. The deadline was the end of the year 2022. And actually, uh, since last uh, October, European Union didn't import coal from the Russia. For oil, this is a little bit delicate because uh, some of countries, particularly the country like Hungary and Slovakia, Czech Republic, they are landlocked country. They don't have a sea. So they don't have capacity to uh, bring uh, oil from maritime route. They, they are really depend on pipeline from the Russia. So those countries are allowed to import Russian oil, but other countries, they just, uh, they just give up and uh, European Union COVID the import of Russian oil from maritime route. For gas, it's very delicate because uh, actually uh, before the war, the roughly 41% of total EU gas imports came from Russia, but uh, most of gas came through pipeline. So it's very, very hard to divert that import from Russia to other country. So there is a kind of a transition period, but the European Union decided to the phase out the import from the Russian gas, and uh, at least uh, 2030, there will be no uh, Russian gas import in uh, European Union. And then, uh, let, let me see. Okay, this is uh, the support to Ukraine. If you go to website of Kiev University Research Institute, you can find all kind of support to Ukraine, even by the uh, the, the international, I mean, the other countries. Uh, United States represent, uh, I didn't count very carefully, but uh, when I count locally, it represents almost 70% 70, 70 of total support given by all countries in the world to Ukraine. Uh, and then the EU institution and European country and the next. And uh, it's particularly in a military area right here, the role of the United States is uh, very, very salient and absolute. But the, the, what is interesting is uh, if, you get, if you calculate the act to Ukraine in terms of national GDP, mm -hmm. actually small country add much more than United States. For example, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Lithuania, those are either Baltic states, which were part of Soviet Union. So they have a kind of a security concern and Poland, Actually, they contribute more than 1% of their GDP to Ukraine. But the, if you get the other country, large country, the share is a little bit small. So this scale of, uh, I mean, the scale of this ad, actually it works as a kind of proxy indicator on how those countries perceive the threat and uh, how those people think about this world. And then uh, let's look at the public opinion in the U U uh, in European Union. Most Europeans show their support to economic sanction against Russia and being added to Ukraine. Uh, 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 November last year, we invited both the Chicago Research Council and uh, Russia to show public opinion poll in US and Russia, right? Uh, when we compare uh, those poll with the European one, actually European, support much more, much more. And uh, they have more hardline uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis Russia on uh, that issues. And uh, from 78 to 90% of all respondents in Finland and uh, Baltic states express support to military aid. So if you get the Dutch country right here, uh, over 90% of people, they support economic sanction. And those country, they, over 90% of people, they support the military aid to Ukraine. Uh, what is the common here is they are either Nordic country, Baltic country, or Poland. And then if you get those country, uh, probably uh, if we go back to that definition, you can find something similar. So there's kind of past dependency from the past while overall opinion uh, support the economic sanction against Russia and military act to the Ukraine. 
So we go back and so again. Okay, uh, let me go to Europe, Russia, and uh, energy relation. This part is very boring, so let me go fast, fast, fast. fast. Okay. Not too fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because of, I have many figures in statistics. The Europe and Russia have a buyer supplier relationship for energy. Who buy? That's Europe. Who supply? That's Russia. But this relation go back to 1960, 1960 or 70s. And uh, if you get the trade data, uh, Russia share of EU import ranged from five to twelve percent in period of between 2012 to 2021. Why there's a big range? Because uh, it really depends on oil price. When oil price is going up, the Russia share is going up to 12%, going down, it's down to 5%. And uh, Russia's export to European Union account for almost 40%. Actually, the Europe is not a replaceable market for Russia. For Russia, 40% of export going to Europe so if Russia lose Europe, actually economic consequences will be catastrophe. Uh, but anyway, the, the Europe have to import from Russia, uh, particularly for fossil oil. That's the main reason that the trade structure have a, a kind of structural deficit. If you get the, the green bar represent a kind of deficit. So, but the, that deficit is fluctuated according to oil prices as well. When oil price is going up, you have more deficit vis-a-vis -vis Russia. In other cases, deficit reduce a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, those, the relationship actually go back to 1960s uh, during the Cold War years. Uh, import from the Soviet Union coincide with the European interest at the time because uh, the the Europe, particularly the West Germany and Austria, they consider Russia as a stable source of energy. Uh, just look at the Middle East. Though. There is a, always kind of, a, I'm sorry to say, but the you know, you know, the political fluctuation, but for Russia, the regime is, a, let's say, stable. So uh, at that time, uh, they regard the Russian gas is a kind of a stable source. If there is a proper pipeline and a loan contract. And also particularly the West Germany, they have a kind of the policy which is called the Ost politic, kind of uh, rapprochement with, uh, with, uh, with the East Bloc. So, uh, and also the Soviet Union, they wanted to supply their gas to the Europe in order to gain a foreign currency, foreign vision. Anyway, they have to import from the free world in order to import, they need the US dollar, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to sell their gas somewhere that was Europe. And also they want to develop their first area in the East, which was uh, untapped. So they try to uh, invite uh, Western finance and uh, the technology. Actually, it was a uh, Western German technology who was heavily involved in uh, construction of uh, the, the oil and gas field in Russia. And during Cold War, oh, that's the big point, I think. That, uh, unlike the United States in a confrontational relation with Russia at the time, both ideology and the military, uh, Western Europe needed a kind of flexible approach because uh, it's just mainly it's due to geographical location. They just share border with the uh, other Soviet bloc. So this kind of approach was uh, necessary from their pers perspective. Uh, uh, during the Cold War, there was no indication in which Soviet Union intentionally reduced gas supply to achieve political and diplomatic objective. Uh, cut up took place quite frequently between Soviet Union and Western Europe, but mainly that's the technical problem in Soviet Union because they broke quite often. But uh, after the dissolution of Soviet Union, Russia has been using natural gas supply as an important political instrument. Uh, from the, it starts from the Yelchin, President Yelchin period up to now. And then uh, let's get the, a little bit of a uh, map and pipeline. 
you can find that the uh, almost half of uh, the gas to Europe comes from Russia. Uh, entire production of Norwegian gas come to Europe. And then portion of US was a uh, minor decrease compared to Russia. So uh, the, uh, let me take an example. The country like uh, Japan and Korea, they all import LNG, liquefied natural gas by maritime route, no pipeline. But uh, for the European country, they mainly import not LNG, but PNG, pipeline natural gas, particularly uh, from Russia. That was a big, big difference between uh, the Europe and uh, the other countries. And then and this is a statistic that I brought from the Russian website. So uh, the number is a little bit over you know, estimated, but the, uh, according to Russian statistic, uh, all gas from Russia go to either Ukraine, Belarus, and a little bit of Turkey to get to Europe. And uh, Europe uh, have a 400, almost 400 BCM as a annual need of gas, but 40% uh, was uh, you know, supplied by the, the Russia. And then uh, those is the maximum capacity of a pipeline which go to the Ukraine. And then, uh, if, could you remember that one? I, I can't pronounce properly, but Urengo, Ujo Road, Ujo Road. Yeah, let's look at this one, okay? It starts from right here, right here. And then go through in that way, and then arrive uh, soon. Small, soon small, 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 small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, it goes through Ukraine, to Western Ukraine, and then it arrived finally Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. Uh, the length is uh, 400, no, no, I'm sorry, uh, 4,500 kilometers, so it's quite long. And what is particular is, is it's actually is constructed in early 1980s. And uh, the German and Japanese and French bank participated to raise finance for that project. And technology and material was supplied by German, Scottish, Japanese, and US company. But uh, we have to remember that Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania in 1980s, they belong to Eastern Bloc, not you know, member of the European Union as nowadays. So we have to understand that this kind of uh, the pipeline under kind of complicated you know, contemporary history in Europe. And uh, Okay, let me see. Oh, ah, this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then uh, there will be several very boring, boring figures. So let me skip <laughs> quickly. The, this is a detailed table of energy dependence of Europe. The, what that table says is uh, Europe have to import energy from outside and uh, more, more than uh, they have to import almost 60 60% of their energy need outside. And the, if you look at the, the country, the situation quite different. Uh, those countries have less dependent on external source as for their energy. But the, some countries, uh, you know, almost 100%, and particularly for natural gas, uh, more than half of uh, EU member states have uh, more than 90% of dependence on their natural gas. And mainly that used to be uh, come from Russia. Uh, when we look at the EU level for crude oil, um, when we define the fossil fuel with the crude oil, the coal and the natural gas, uh, for crude oil, Russia represents uh, almost 27%, and uh, coal is uh, 47%, and uh, gas is 41%. So Russia was the main provider of uh, the energy for Europe for more than 20 years, 20, 30 years. Okay. And then uh, the, this is a natural gas dependent, how much they depend on Russia for natural gas, petroleum, and coal. The country of Czech Republic, 100% of their gas import come from Russia. And then uh, those percent is uh, small, 
but uh, on other country, but the for petrol and uh, solid, uh, the coal is uh, almost the same. The problem is uh, there's many countries who sell petrol. We can you know, import from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United States, Norway, elsewhere. And for coal, coal can import from Australia. But in case of natural gas, actually it's a kind of a monopoly because uh, the transport mechanism is really stop to test dependency and it's very hard to devote to other country. And uh, uh, Germany is a very interesting case because uh, the share of import from Russia was uh, 40% in 2013, but it increased 65% in 2020. They imposed sanction uh, each other over annexation of Crimea, but the Germany import more and more gas from Russia. So that was the, the one of the reason that one of the main point that the Angela Merkel is now uh, criticized while she was uh, the, the appreciated great leader of Germany and Europe for a long, long time. And then uh, this figure is a little bit uh, the, the complicated. What I want to uh, show is uh, those country right here, group one is a, uh, let's say nice country in terms of energy dependency, and they use a high level of renewable energy vehicle, solar energy, wind energy, and you know, but the, I'm sorry, those country, they have a high energy dependence, but they use a low level of renewable. But actually it includes many Western European countries such as you know, Belgium, Germany, Italy. So that grouping shows how, those country is vulnerable on uh, Russian gas. If you are independent from Russian gas, you can be, uh, you know, you, you can impose a strong action against Russia without any problem. Uh, I will show you a little bit later how Sweden and Finland and those country the support the, you know, the strong against strong action against Russia. Actually, this is all related to this kind of their energy background. Okay, <laughs> now we come to 2022. The, when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine in 24 February, just, uh, just two weeks later, two weeks later, European Commission published their energy transition plan. That was, uh, I was really, really shocked when I saw that plan because uh, the, they said the uh, diversification energy source from Russia to other countries acceleration of new and renewable energy and strengthening their energy efficiency. But what was shocking for me was uh, this one. EU intended to stop importing oil and coal by the end of 2022. You import 40% of your import needs from Russia, but suddenly you don't import. From economist point of view, it was impossible, impossible. So I was uh, really shocked, but some of the plan uh, what's going on, have been going on as expected. I will show you some statistics a little later. Uh, if you look at the, the gas import of Europe, uh, the red color represents decrease in import. And the uh, green color uh, shows an increase in import. The import from Russia decreased considerably after the war in Ukraine, invasion of Russia invasion in Ukraine. But the import from Norway and global LNG, actually it's the United States, mm -hmm. the import from the United States actually skyrocketed, skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem is uh, those countries didn't have LNG terminal. You know, to import the LNG, you have a special facility in your harbor, but the, the country like Germany, they have zero, zero LNG terminal. So uh, the European, country, they precipitate to construct new energy terminal since uh, March 2020. And uh, there will be, the number of energy terminal will be doubled pretty soon. And uh, in 2022, Europe accounted for 32% of global LNG import in the world. As you know, the Europe represents uh, a little less than 20% of global economy. But the, in 2022, they represent more than 30% of global import of LNG because they 
reported from Russia to energy market in extremely quick uh, period of time, a uh, short period of time. And then according to prospect, prospect uh, let me show the prospect a little bit. The bar, bar shows the uh, overall supply of gas to European market. This is the uh, overall capacity of supply of gas to European market. And that three line is the uh, overall the demand in Europe. Uh, according to several projects, the, the demand will uh, you know, continuously decrease and most of salient is the uh, Repower EU, which was uh, announced in uh, last year. Uh, if you get the share of Russian gas right here, it decreased and uh, virtually from 2000, 2003, uh, I mean, 2023 and 24 is uh, much, much smaller. Uh, uh, so, so what that figure said is uh, uh, after 2024, there will be oversupply of gas in European market. So the last year and this year is a really, really critical point. You, they have to uh, well pass this year. From the 2024, there will be you know, much the supportable situation I and mean, much supportable situation will happen. <laughs> and then, uh, Another point, how Europeans uh, prepare for that energy crisis is uh, gas storage. Uh, EU plan to reach at least 80% of gas storage for all countries by November 1st, 2022. That decision was proposed in March 23, so just one month after invasion of Russia. But the uh, all country, uh, EU, uh, in average, EU member reached this call mid-October. When uh, first November was at first November, uh, they have ninety-five percent of fuel. I mean, uh, if you drive and your <laughs> gas store is, is just a half empty, full and almost empty, you you know the the the, the feeling is different, right? We have to find the, the the gas station, otherwise we have a problem. But they they Gas to is a really 95%. And uh, climate change actually helped Europe as well, because uh, yeah, just like in Ann Harbor, it was not at all cold uh, during last year. So there was a less and less demand of uh, the gas. And uh, if you look at the country level, <clears throat> the most of most countries, France, Germany, Italy, and Netherlands, they start <clears throat> to fill out their gas. But the not immediately. This is a, the the starting point of a Russian invasion. But not immediately. They just wait until summer. Uh, one of the reason is uh, you remember that the after invasion of Russia, the oil price and gas price skyrocketed, right? Particularly March and April. So it was very hard to you know the the purchase of gas during that period. So from the uh, after summer, they start to fill out and uh, France fill out 99%, their gas tool is full. They can't import anymore. They all have old man, Germany 99% and so on and so on. But um, this is a uh, Central Eastern European country. Just look at Poland. You, you can compare itinerary of Poland and France. Actually, they precipitate to fill up their storage, even from April. April, why? Actually, the misconception is playing this kind of you know, energy policy as well. They, are, they feel they are more vulnerable to Russia, not only in terms of economics, but the security. So they precipitate, to, uh, I mean, fill out their gas, gas storage from the August. And even in June, uh, they almost feel 100%. So that's, so compare other country, and for Latvia, only 60%. So I was curious. So my speculation is uh, Latvia is a small country and uh, they, don't, they are not really depend on the, the, the fossil fuel. And uh, even before the war in Ukraine, they have full operate LNG terminal. 
So they are, you know, kind of come out. We can uh, import from the, the Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United States. So we just wait. But that, I think that's uh, uh, the, the typical, you know, policy tense of Latvia at the time. Okay. And then now uh, we will get a little bit of a changing uh, Russian economic relation. There is also a little bit fooling figure and you know, statistic, but uh, what I'm emphasizing is uh, just that drop. Just to, we remember that drop, that that will be okay. Okay, right after the war in Ukraine and the invasion of Russia, use export to Russia drop in dramatic way, dramatic way, and uh, the. Uh, when we compare the use export from March to this, uh, December last year, compared to same period of uh, year 2021, uh, there was almost a half drop of uh, uh, use export to Russia. And then uh, we'll get the component of that drop right here. Actually, the, the item with the large drop in export were concentrated in manufacturing sectors, such as machinery and transport. Uh, I think that will cause a, a really serious problem for Russia in long term, not short term, but long, short term as well, but long term, because if you don't have machine, you don't have equipment, how you can produce uh, the necessary, the electronic and you know, whatever, whatever. So probably they can, uh, they can manage uh, to produce for a while, but the long-term impact will be, I, mean, I think they, uh, there will be tremendous. And then uh, input from Russia to Europe, it dropped as well. When we look at in value term, million euro, there's not big change or sometimes it increased because of the oil and gas price skyrocketed. So even though the European Union uh, import less, much less, in value term is more. But when we calculate with the uh, weight, there are clear indication of uh, the fall in import from Russia. And according to European Commission, the gas import from the Russia represent uh, 9%. That was uh, 41% before, but it dropped to 9%. So that's a dramatic change. And then, but if you get the, this one, the blue line represent uh, that import from the Russia. And then this one represents the US. So we observe uh, US uh, import from the US natural gas skyrocketing. And uh, now it's more, much more what they import from Russia. Uh, okay. okay, this is the last chapter. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, explain a kind of a survey data. Uh, European. Uh, see the war in Ukraine as a major threat to European national security is clear, clear. And uh, most people support the idea that EU should be independent from Russian energy as soon as possible. And they also support military cooperation in the uh, They also support the standing against the Russian invasion is defending European values. That's clear. However, so those Europeans are worried about the nuclear war or escalation of conflict to other country. And also they were also worried about economic recession and inflation in their own country as well. So the, the key word of uh, this perception is I think uh, risk perception, risk awareness and economic impact. So there are two, the, 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 the two elements which are calculated in their mindset when they have a public perception of a, when they have a perception of a, the war in Ukraine. Yes, this one, yes. There was an interesting uh, question. Uh, let me read a little bit. The uh, thinking about the war in Ukraine and its consequence, where do you position yourself between those two statements? The first statement is uh, depends about common European value, such as freedom and democracy must be a priority, even if this impact price and cost of living. So this means uh, we need a strong action against Russia because uh, uh, the, uh, this action is actually depending on our value. Let, let me say this is a value-based strong action. 
right here. And then the second answer is uh, maintaining price and cost of living must be priority, even if this effect depends on common, common European value. Uh, let me term the compromise and negotiation. When we look at the statistic of uh, all countries, those countries, those countries support more, more value-based action, but uh, those countries, they demand, uh, oh, we need a negotiation, uh, I mean, kind of compromise with Russia. So the, if you look at the, the, the public opinion, new member states, of course, as a name of the EU, they have a common stand with the, the Russia, but inside the European Union, there is divergence of opinion. And then uh, I made a kind of a hypothesis. There is a five hypotheses that I want to uh, test a little bit in basic way. The first hypothesis is uh, public opinion on the war in Ukraine is influenced by threat perception of citizens regarding the war. Uh, this vertical axis represents a share of people who said Russia invasion is a threat to EU security. And then uh, when it's going up, more sanction to Russia. I'm, I'm sorry, more the sanction to Russia. This means a kind of a compromise. And a bottom is a more top measure to Russia, value-based approach. If you look at here, those country right here, Nordic country, Poland, Denmark, Sweden, and Netherlands, mainly a Western European country together with uh, Poland, they support, uh, you know, we need more, more, the, the value-based approach against Russia, while those countries, they have a different you know, the, the stance. And then uh, support for military aid to Ukraine, you can find a similar trend. What is interesting is uh, those countries, the Netherlands, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, let's say the Nordic country, Netherlands is not a Nordic country, but they close each other. So the, they have a common stance. And then a second hypothesis is a public opinion on the war in Ukraine is influenced by economic impact of the war. You can find a similar trend uh, those country, those country, particularly the, those poor country, there are less people who said, my personal income declined due to the war. But the, in those country, they said, my personal income is deteriorated, declined due to the war. So we can find a kind of a clear correlation between the two questions. And then when we put the renewable energy, share of renewable energy instead of, uh, instead of uh, the income deterioration, we can find uh, the opposite relation. I mean, the, the country who use uh, more renewable energy, they support top action against Russia. And then a third hypothesis is uh, affinity toward Russia. The, the country who have, uh, let's say, the good image of, over Russia, uh, exactly. that have uh, influenced member states' opinion in the EU hardware because to Russia. Uh, for example, those countries have, uh, let's say, the, the relatively good image over Russia due to historic, mm -hmm. cultural, religious, and political Kind of relation. And uh, the country who have a positive image of US, they have the opposite relation. Actually, the, I have data on China as well. So I try to put the China instead of Russia. Uh, I obtain exactly the same here. So mm -hmm. I'm curious. And uh, uh, the data on China is much more available. For Russia, here it, uh, the, the data is constantly work, but for the China, it's uh, the 10 years uh, data. So I want to uh, analyze further after this presentation. And then uh, is there left and right division? Left is, a, I, I'm not sure the democratic and right is improving. <laughs> it's not clear, it's not clear. The division is not clear, but let's say there is a right and there is a left. Uh, do, the, do the European left and right have different view on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In Korea, there is it's very, very different. But uh, in case of, in Europe, actually no difference. 
no difference. According to survey, there's no difference of view in this issue along with the political spectrum. About 60% respondents of both left and right, uh, they support one, I mean, the more value-based approach. And only 40% support the second one. And then the, this is the last one, last one. Income and education level affect opinion on EU's response to Russian invasion? Yes, clearly. Clearly, people with higher, higher income overwhelmingly support a more value-based approach, and they tend to understand uh, the war in Ukraine as a kind of a clash between liberal democracy and authoritarianism. But the lower income or a lower education level is associated with the, the more policy orientation, which emphasizes the economic. So actually, it's a, it's a, it's a natural consequence because you know the uh, if you are you, you are you know, the, actually the poor people is more they vulnerable to energy crisis and any kind of economic downturn okay so this is the last chapter last one last one conclusion <laughs> <laughs> um the this is my my opinion my assessment the effort of the european union cut up russian energy has been so much successful successful because in early 2020, early last year, uh, there was a lot of concern that the energy crisis would hit entire European economy. And, but the EU quickly succeeded in diversifying energy import from Russia to other countries. And also EU member states have been able to maintain unified in their strong response to Russia while there is some internal divergent opinion. On the other hand, uh, as I said, the, the European perception of war in Ukraine differs so much from country to country. The key word that can explain that difference is, just as I said, as I said, security perception and economic impact. The, uh, as we know, the common foreign security policy of the European Union is decided in unanimous way, and a military add to Ukraine is largely uh, dependent on each member's decision. Of course, it's coordinated at NATO, but the, it's a sovereign decision, sovereign decision of each country to uh, contribute to the to Ukraine. Uh, reaching an agreement among EU member states is essential, essential not only for the sanction against Russia, but also the promotion of the EU energy transition plan and also a long-term uh, security project of the European Union. So uh, what I'm emphasizing is uh, solidarity is necessary among member states. And also uh, it's necessary to create a measure to bridge economic burden and uh, the gap in uh, security perception among member countries. Otherwise, there will be a uh, kind of difficult time to uh, create a unified and coherent stance vis a vis Russia. Okay, that's the end of uh, my presentation. And if you have any question, I will answer in detail. Thank you very much. We have time for questions, so I will. Do you want to? I oh, actually, I do. So Katarina, yes. then Christine. Yes, Riduk, thank you for this presentation. It's so important for us Ukrainians to understand that it's your interest. And thank you for this research. And my question is, um, uh, taking the fact that uh, Ukraine is already a candidate in uh, joining EU, what is maybe you research this or you have a perception of this or any um, idea, your thoughts, uh, how this might influence if Ukraine joins EU, uh, how the policies, the synergy policies would change or not change, and how that can influence all this um, economic uh, map presented yes. to us. Uh, the, as you know, the, the Ukraine is the largest country in Europe, except Russia. Uh, so when Ukraine joined the European Union together with its whole population, Actually, that will link for the European Union as well. Uh, the, if you look at the, the accession process to European Union of a previous country, usually it takes uh, at least three to five years to be nominated as a candidate country. And then it takes another three, five years to be full member of the European Union. Uh, because uh, one of the reasons is uh, this is a really chapter by chapter negotiation with the European Union, uh, who, which take uh, attitude of uh, 
take all or leave the attitude with scoring. Take all EU regulation, otherwise, no. But in case of Ukraine, it's really, really specific, particular. Uh, just, just a few months after official application to the European Union, the EU give full candidate status. So five years for Romania, but just three months for Ukraine. And then a uh, real negotiation to be a member of the European Union. Uh, for usual uh, negotiation, take too many time because uh, Ukraine have to actually to become a full member of the European Union is simple. But the, what is complicated is uh, the changing all national regulation along with the EU regulation. Take time because it's a national parliament who's doing that job, right? So uh, uh, my opinion is that EU will create special status for Ukrainian. This is a kind of a, uh, it's kind of poor members, but the, 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 the case is completely different from previous cases. So uh, I expect there will be special, special status for Ukrainian and uh, uh, there will be quite, quite soon, quite soon. Yeah. But the, uh, for now, Ukraine, 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 and Ukrainian national have all right to participate all kind of EU program, research program, maybe Erasmus and everything, everything, mm -hmm. uh, for example, except uh, foreign, foreign and security policy. There is a kind of opting out principle, even for Denmark, the country like Denmark, they, I think they don't participate in mm -hmm. EU defense policy because they opt out. So this kind of creative way will be completely possible for Ukraine to create special status. Thank you so much for this really interesting talk. And the what are you, what you call boring statistics are actually quite counterintuitive and interesting. Like breaking uh, thanks, out thanks East and much. West Germany was also uh, interesting and telling. I have a question about. Um, about the effect on of sanctions on Russia. And uh, part of this comes from knowing that the sanctions of 2014 really didn't have a whole lot of effect on Russian public opinion. And some of the sanctions on luxury food goods, no, nobody cared. Um, and so when you say that 40% that, that uh, imports or exports would be cut, exports would be cut by 40%, I'm wondering who that would affect. Like, do those profits just go to oligarchs? Or how would everyday people in everyday life, yeah. would people in everyday life yeah, yeah. Um, experience anything? Uh, uh, I'm not Russian expert, so I don't know in detail, but there, I can say just one thing. There are only two countries in the world who is possible for self-sufficiency for energy and food. There are only two countries in the world. Could you tell me two countries? US. And, and Russia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> US and Russia. So the the sanction for the country who have a full, you know, I mean, the self-sufficiency on energy and food uh, is quite difficult. It takes a long time. Uh, if you impose uh, the country who have 100% uh, of uh, dependence of energy, actually, the effect will be just to, you know, very, very cheap. But the, that's the first point. And the second point is, uh, uh, we all know that Russia is not a democracy. Of course, they have a government, Congress, court, everything, but we never said that Russia is a liberal democracy. We just call it as authoritarianism, right? So, and also they don't have free media. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that the President Putin can uh, control the Russia for a long time. And uh, the, when I meet my student, and I always said, what is common between you and me is uh, when you are a student, President is Putin in Russia. When I was a student in university, President Putin was president. <laughs> so he was a president for more than uh, 20 years, except short period of a primary ship, but it was a uh, kind of, you know. So the, if you've grown up uh, seeing, uh, the, seeing uh, Putin as president for more than uh, 20 years, uh, 25 years, uh, it's very hard to you know the, go against uh, that person because we have become kind of obedient and so on. So uh, I think that's the situation. But uh, it's just sure the, the the life quality has been deteriorating so far, and uh, uh, 
the when we saw the statistic of GDP growth rate in Russia, Russia has a negative growth rate 2022 this year, but uh, two year consecutive negative growth is the first time for Russia since 1990. So I think they suffer. They suffer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just see the last point about solidarity among the members, how uh, important that is. Uh, I listen to a lot of uh, German debates. I'm usually uh, originally from Germany, and we have the uh, people who support uh, providing arms, uh, sending weapons to the Ukraine. And then we have the people who are to the very left, the Linke, they had a big demonstration this past Sunday. They want the, uh, the say, giving weapons, providing weapons to Ukraine. They want this stopped. And yesterday I heard them say they would like to include China to be a negotiator. Uh, can you tell us how, what role could China <laughs> or even South Africa and Brazil, they mentioned Brazil, what role can these countries play uh -huh. to achieve diplomatic solutions? Because it's, how can we trust somebody like Putin? Yes, yes, uh, that's a really, really good question. Uh, let me answer it that way. Uh, what I surprised when I arrived in University of Michigan first time, there were many, many Chinese students, many, many Chinese students. Uh, the, uh, in my university, we have a lot of Chinese students as well. The most numerous students in terms of one single nationality. Uh, actually, it's mean, uh, uh, it shows that China's connection to the world. Uh, China is clearly, clearly authoritarianism, and they become increasingly more authoritarian than before. So the China, uh, 12 years ago, and now is different. Different, uh, but uh, the if China provide a weapon to Russia yeah. in full scale, actually that's a completely the political and diplomatic decoupling with the United States that uh, China didn't want for now. Didn't want for right. now. They are not there to uh, take uh, the frontal confrontation with the United States. They still want to stick to let's say the globalization. So uh, I think China is uh, kind of uh, the country who take most advantage of the situation because uh, uh, China uh, actually they import the Russian gas and oil cheap price. And uh, Russia and China relation is not so very, very friendly because they are neighboring country. Mm -hmm. They compete each other for Eurasia best con continent. The, Situation in war in Ukraine pushed Russia to get closer to China for now, but uh, eventually they have some competition relation. So uh, China tried to, uh, I, I think China will provide something to Russia, but that would not, you know, the tank and that, that, that that's not that kind of thing. That, that's just the electronic product and uh, some product which is necessary to the functioning of the uh, Russian economy. And, uh, and yes, that, so, but I don't think China can take the role of a full, honest uh, the broker between uh, Russia and Ukraine and Russia and Western countries. Thank you. If I want to ask, just because it piggybacks on Christie's question before I give you the voice. Um, so, so you talked about the impact, or Christy was asking about the impact of sanctions on the Russian population, but there's also an impact of the sanctions on European countries if 40%, if I remember well, 40% of their exports to Russia, right, there's a diminution of 40% of their exports to Russia. So could that have an impact on, on the support of the war in Ukraine because they're losing a significant part of, of their market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 
uh, when I arrived in in United States, Michigan, everybody people all oh, prices went up uh, compared to last last years and housing price and everything. But if you look at the statistics in Europe, the much worse than the United States. Mm -hmm. For example, for the Baltic country, the inflation rate is over twenty percent, twenty percent. And for Czech Republic and Poland, most of the Central and Eastern European countries is around fifteen percent. Fifteen is a double of the United States. And for Germany and uh, France, it's much a little bit less, but the United Kingdom is ten percent. So uh, it's clear European country they support but ordinary people they support very very much as well. But uh, there were many support measures of a uh, European government using a public money for electricity and so on. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have that data on initial presentation, but I just skip and take it out to too long. But that uh, support is uh, given to almost uh, support during uh, the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. In that way, they can compensate a little bit. Another point is uh, the I want a little bit the emphasize the role of uh, social security and the income equality in countries. The oh, I'm sorry, this one. Okay. If you look at the Deutsch country, Deutsch country, they are a country who have a social social state model. Even during war in Ukraine, a severe inflation, they have less people who said, I lost my money due to inflation because their income equality is uh, quite well advanced compared to other countries. And social security compensate uh, any loss of their income during the time recession and uh, related to war in Ukraine. But uh, if you look at the Deutsche country, uh, we can clearly understand that Deutsche country have uh, less developed social security now, and uh, they have uh, maybe they have uh, more income quality. But anyway, social security net is uh, pressure compared to Deutsche country. Uh, I don't have any scientific evidence to insist that uh, we need more more income equality to have uh, the unified stance to, th th this is too much jump up, mm -hmm. but uh, I personally believe that uh, this kind of uh, egalitarian society contribute to uh, lay force, the country and society when there is an external challenge. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. First of all, thank you for presenting this topic for us today. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, is uh, uh, about compensation. So uh, after the European sanctions, uh, Russia turned uh, trading natural sources to Asia. Mm -hmm. Is it possible they will compensate all these losses in Europe? Uh, on the Asian uh, uh, market. And uh, second one question, because you present South and Korea, uh -huh. uh, I don't know, is South and Korea depends somehow of Russian natural sources? Yes, that, that's a very good and interesting question. The, the, I, I'm, uh, I just, you know, the social scientists, we, have, we don't have to the mix our personal, personal belief and uh, scientific fact, but the, my personal belief is uh, Europe is not depreciable market for Russia. Uh, the Russia, uh, the Europe represents uh, almost 80% of Russian natural resource, resource export. How India and China replace Russia without proper pipeline? So it will take a long, long time. We said the Roman is not the built in a day, but the, let me say that pipeline is not built uh, in a day as well. Okay, yeah, yes, yes. It took uh, you know, 40 years to set up that pipeline. And you know, if you put uh, some small pipeline to China, that it's not possible to send all the gas to China. And then for the second question is, uh, in early 2000, in early 2000, there was a kind of a good relation between Korea and uh, Russia, and there was a kind of a common proposal to develop uh, 
gas the area in uh, you know the upper the Vladivostok there is uh, the vast area of gas the finally Korean government said no one of the reasons is uh, once we put the pipeline uh, it's not the import just a small quantity the quantity should be uh, 25 percent of total Korean input demand because the pipeline is very very expensive to set down so uh, that should cover 25% of uh, total Korean input of natural gases. But the problem is that uh, once there is political, let's say, accident, incident, what happened? We can, can uh, Korea find uh, another alternative uh, import sources quickly? The answer was no. So after kind of feasibility study, Korean government said no. So, and uh, the input from the Russia is uh, small, very small. Most of the imports comes from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Good enough. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yudu, for your presentation. And I would like to ask if you um, looked at it at all, the European Green Deal, this uh, agreement and the plan to turn Europe into a carbon but climate neutral continent by 2050. Mm -hmm. So is this affected by the ongoing war? And uh, in which way? Yes, you know. yes. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really, really sure that the that uh, the invasion of Russian invasion in Ukraine accelerate mm -hmm. accelerate EU's climate change policy. Yeah. Uh, when you try to uh, 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 introduce a top regulation of climate change, there's a huge business society who said no, 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 and there's many way of lobbying, etc. Et but that in Russian invasion, the dissipate uh, this kind of lobbying uh, and uh, the, there is a strong the momentum to push forward the uh, European Green Deal. But uh, for some countries, developing countries, it's very stressful as well because uh, when EU introduces something, something good, they tend to impose those things to other countries. Uh, we, saw, we say the EU is a regulatory exporter. They export not rules. petrol, but they export rules. <laughs> so uh, that will be a challenge to developing countries for future. Yeah. Um, well, you said uh, just as recently as last month that there were sanctions put against Russia by the EU. Do you see any like profound effects of these sanctions against um, Russia that would make them actually want to end the war? Or do you believe that they're like powerful enough as to where they can keep going and Putin can keep going for as long as he wants until Ukraine, uh, until they do get Ukraine back into the fold? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, the, the, when some people ask me what is uh, what will be the consequence, I mean, the ending point of the war, uh, the, uh, actually, the, I have uh, nearly no ideas, but the, the when I, since I came here, I asked the same question to the former diplomat who was here and here, and they said, uh, the, uh, as long as uh, President Zelensky have a willingness to fight, the United States will support whatever it takes. But every war is end by negotiation. Mm -hmm. So that surely there is uh, some point of negotiation, but uh, for now, the, the Putin is too, not strong, but too fragile to lose this war. And uh, President Zelensky have a willingness to the, the, the recover the territory occupied by, by Russia. So still, this is a, a little early for negotiation, but we will see what will happen. But anyway, every war ends with the negotiation. But the sanctions are not I mean, there's new sanctions being imposed on Russia and they don't seem to make a big difference, right? That's your question. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do they keep uh, adding new sanctions if it doesn't make a difference? Uh, most big sanction is energy sectors that was already done, but uh, there is a more sanction list, uh, kind of checking list. Uh, and then uh, whenever they uh, have a, the, the war is accelerated, the uh, European Union put uh, more sanction, more sanction, but all sanction is highly coordinated in the United States. So if you look at the sanction list of the United States and the European Union, 
uh, it's almost the uh, same sequence. Even the day is very similar. When they announce uh, the day is very similar. So uh, I think there's more sanction list. Uh, for example, the, if you look at the, the trade data, still European Union import the gas and petrol from the from the Russia. This means there's still room for sanction. And then uh, the major Russian bank was excluded from the SWIP, the interbanking payment mm -hmm. system. But there's still the window of the banking sector, which is possible to send the money between the Europe and Russia and Korea and Russia and elsewhere. It's not completely the, 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 the closed. So I think there is a more uh, march of sanction that the uh, United States and the European Union can do, but uh, it's just looking at the, the situation. They just looking at the situation. When situations go worse, there will be more sanction, more sanction. And if they impose a completely, completely cut for the first time, actually it's the, 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 the complete will not be manageable. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, um, I'm just curious, going way back, you know, going macro, super macro, uh, thank you for the detailed information. And I was happy to see Quinn's visual mentioned on the uh, one of your maps, uh, which is the latest LNG import terminal, but it's it's offshore. What I'm more interested in though is your economic forecast. I mean, along the lines earlier, someone asked, if Europe is losing 40% of its exports, the United States generates at least 30% of its income from European profits. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, again, super macro, how long in your estimation, your historical research, does it take a country to cut its interest, its inflation rate in half? Um, the, 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 uh, it takes time, but the, the, what we are experienced experience as a inflation, actually it's a supply shock. The major supply shock we experienced yeah. is yeah. Uh, the first oil shock in 19, early 1970, yeah. second oil shock in late 1970, okay. and then uh, COVID pandemic and uh, this case. Uh, okay. Once war is uh, finished and uh, the, 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 it is handled out and uh, sort, sorting out, and uh, uh, I think inflation we fading away, but the, the the this year still it will remain high, and uh, uh, probably take uh, until next years. Next, two but, years. Yeah, two, at least two years, uh, because it's a supply shock. For demand shock, there is a manual. There is a manual how to handle. Just increase your budget spending as an expansionary fiscal policy. And uh, lose money, and I mean the, the, the release money from the central bank, the so expansionary monetary policy. But in case of a uh, supply shock, there is no manual, there's no way. Well, it's an interesting point you bring up because you have a reduction in demand while the M2 supply has skyrocketed by 40% over the past five years. There's so much liquidity out there, and yet there's not enough supply to fulfill it. So there's a gigantic liquidity gap. There's a gigantic spread, so to speak, between the amount of capital in the system and the M2 supply uh -huh. and the actual amount of the velocity of money. Mm -hmm. So however quickly that happens, there still is a, a wide chasm, it seems to me, yeah. between capital in the system and, and actual demand, where the actual level of demand is uh -huh. to meet that supply. Yeah. And uh, why is it difficult for this case is, um, when there's inflation, usually it's driven by increasing demand, yeah. increased demand, and also excess of money in financial market. But in that case, inflation is driven by lack of material, lack yeah. of energy. Right. So uh, it's very hard to increase uh, production in short time. So it's why I, uh, I suspect that there will be uh, at least two years to the dissipate all uh, kind of the inflation pressure both in Europe and the uh, United States. So, so it's not good time as a business professor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It is time to conclude. Um, so please um, 
Let's congratulate. Thank you. Thank you.